Jesus, um, I declare. Trying to find my agenda. I do, I do, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to find my agenda papers. I declare the committee meeting open on Tuesday, the 3rd of September at uh, 6 57 uh, pm. The committee meeting open and advises that the meeting of the committee meetings will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that audio and visual recording uh, is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used or disclosed or published publicly by council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and that pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. And we acknowledge our continuing importance to the Ghana people here today. We have apologies from Councillor Kira. Uh, members, before I um, move uh, for confirmation of the minutes, if council members want a, a quick recess. Yes, Can I have someone to please adjourn? Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hyde. I'll put that. All those in favour? All those against? Members and members of the public, there will be a, an adjournment for five minutes. Just a quick recess of council members. Uh, they've been in a meeting for the last two hours straight. Thank you and I appreciate your patience. <laughs>
for their patience. Um, we'll move on to item three, the confirmation of minutes. If I can have a mover, thank you, Councillor Sims. Can I have a second, please? Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Um, any debate on the previous minutes of the meeting on the 20th of August 2019? Be it that there's none, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, all those against, that are to carry. Move on to item four, um, and I'll hand over to the CEO. We're dealing with item 4.1 first. Welcome. A presentation on Lot 14 uh, Renewal SA. Through the chair, I'll get um, Clinton to introduce it. Thanks. Uh, through the chair, and uh, thank you, members. This presentation tonight is in relation to feedback we received from Council at its last committee meeting on the 20th of August. Um, Council sought additional information in relation to the Lot 14 redevelopment and how it relates to the public realm on North Terrace. Um, I'd just like to welcome uh, two, two presenters tonight, uh, Mark Devine, uh, Acting CEO from Renewal SA, and also James Hayter, who's the Director from Oxygen Architects, who are the design architects for Lot 14 and notably also the design architects for the original 2001 North Terrace Master Plan. Uh, presentation gives particular attention to how the development deals with uh, the council owned assets on uh, North Terrace, including the footpath, road, curb, street furniture, landscaping and trees. Um, and I'll now hand over to Mark to uh, run through the presentation. Thank you, and thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to present this evening. Um, I'll give a short introduction about some of the bigger context to the master plan and the landscape plans, and I'll hand over to James to talk through some more of the detail that you'll be interested in. I think it's important to note that there's a bigger story tonight rather than just seeking land or consent to remove nine trees. Um, and that, that bigger story really has its genesis in the move of the hospital from the east end of the city to the west end. What comes with that is the move of a significant amount of workers and daytime activity. To the east end of the, to the west end of the city and leaves behind really over 20 obsolete buildings at that end of the city. That really creates an opportunity to imagine how the east end of North Terrace will, will play a role in the city um, and also provides an opportunity for Council to consider its own aspirations for this cultural boulevard um, and the role that Lot 14 will play uh, within North Terrace. Now, I could just, I think that needs to be on slide show and move to the next slide. So, Okay, so. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of government's ambition for the site, it's been pretty clear that the, the current government has a, a real ambition to make the most of job creation, education and cultural opportunities on this site. Um, and the investment behind that so far is over $500 million in delivering on that aspiration. Um, and I think a lot has been said about the, the 6,000 new workers that will be brought to Lot 14. Um, we're talking about entrepreneurs, innovators, researchers, highly skilled, highly paid jobs in the future coming to this site. But I think in terms of the role of North Terrace, it's also really important to focus on the visitor economy and then how the role that Lot 14 will play there. And I think looking at the image on the screen there, future generations will catch a tram to the east end of the city down North Terrace. When they get off the new tram stop there, directly in front of them, the first thing they'll see is the new Space Discovery Centre. What Space Discovery Centre is, is the first time Quest Econ has come out of Canberra um, interstate and they'll be setting themselves up here in South Australia. That's 60 to 70,000 visitors a year coming to the site, students um, and, um, uh, on North Terrace. We'll also have uh, a future Aboriginal art and cultural gallery, which in itself is an investment of about $150 million and will be a major draw of tourists and visitors to the site. And I think for the first time, it's really important that LA Botanic Gardens will feel like it's connected, connected to North Terrace with the opening up of the boulevard. I think once completed, it's really important to note that the major tourism node this will create, and it will likely be one of the most visited segments of North Terrace with both the worker activity and the visitor activity. It really has the opportunity to weigh, change the way South Australians use North Terrace and use this east end part of the city. If we look at the landscape plans itself, um, certainly the plans for us are, are again part of a much larger landscape plan for the site and a master plan for the site. Um, we certainly have a really good opportunity now to design the way North Terrace fits into the future use of this site. Um, 
We certainly plan to integrate these works that we're doing now with our broader landscape works. Um, and it certainly be very challenging for us to come back and revisit these works at a later stage once the current stage works are completed. Um, in terms of designing it, we've been, we've been working with the Adelaide City Master Plan for North Terrace um, to guide us as the best guide we have as how what Council's aspirations are for North Terrace. I think our aspirations are quite clear is that previously there was a significant amount of build form in the site and it's very hard to navigate your way through it. We really want to open the site up to make it a, um, a really strong first impression but also to be able to draw people into the site <coughs> with major attractions and major new workplaces. <coughs> Um, the master plan itself, from an open space point of view, built form is significantly reduced. The amount of open space will increase from 20% to over 50%. And whilst we're proposing to remove nine trees on North Terrace, there'll be over 50 trees planted in the first stage of, uh, of landscaping alone. So a major reinvestment in, in, in the, the opening up of the site and the landscape of the site. So that's a very general, a broader introduction to our master plan. I'll now have it to James to talk to some of the more detail of the uh, the landscape plan itself, particularly as it relates to council plan. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chair and councillors, for giving us the opportunity to talk to you about it. Uh, to me, this is such an exciting uh, opportunity we have here. Um, this is called Precinct Four of a master plan that was started in 1994. So it's been many, many years coming about, and this is another piece in a puzzle of the North Terrace Cultural Boulevard. And I don't think we can underplay how important North Terrace is to Adelaide uh, and its reputation both in Australia and overseas. It's actually one of the great boulevards of the world, and it's only getting better uh, in it. So this gives us a chance, I think, to uh, finish another piece of it. This is from the 1998 uh, North Terrace Precinct Master Plan, which set up the project and we're in uh, Precinct 4. This is from the 2001 uh, North Terrace Master Plan. So that was the original plan, master plan that was done. So I was part of the author of uh, preparing this. It shows a wide boulevard, and I suppose there are two major changes which have happened since that was done. One is that the hospital's moved, <laughs> uh, which is a fairly major change, but also the tram has been uh, put down North Terrace, and that wasn't envisaged, of course, back in 2001, and that has had an effect on the planning of it. In a sense, the tram's great, it's a destination, it takes people there but it also blocks the two sides of uh, North Terrace from each other. So it's got its positives, great positives. There are some negatives associated with it, which uh, weren't reflected in the original master plan. The two documents, which again are policy documents, which sit alongside of the North Terrace master plan, uh, an original one, street squares and parklands, which were written back in 1998, and then the Adelaide Design Manual, which uh, sets policy for North Terrace. So street squares and parklands identified North Terrace as a ceremonial boulevard. So King William Street, North Terrace were identified under that report. And then the Adelaide Design Manual reinforces that in terms of the detail. Both of those reports prioritise pedestrian experience within the city and the uh, CBD, and they recognise North Terrace as a place for public ceremony and event. The master plan for Lot 14 incorporates the North Terrace footpath as an integral part of it. The diagram in the top right shows how Lot 14 is connected into the city itself. It's a major destination and part of how the city works and is structured. So we're not just talking here about a footpath, we're actually talking about an integrated site plan that goes uh, fees from footpath back into uh, the site itself and the two of them have been conceived together, not as separate parts. Looking at a, a photo montage of uh, it from, if you like, Frome Street looking back towards Botanic Gardens, you can see how, again, you're not looking at a footpath, you're looking at a, a space which is an entry into Lot 14, but it's also a destination in itself. The plans that uh, we're looking at are part of, again, a process of alignment with the, the uh, city's development plan, the Adelaide's development plan, 
So in, in that terms, an application was lodged in February 2019, which included a statutory referral to the City of Adelaide. Uh, the application was approved by SCAP in July, uh, which included tree removal conditional on landlord consent, City of Adelaide's consent to it. The desired future character or character statement in the uh, development plan and the applicable objectives state and call for an improvement in pedestrian amenity and pedestrian access is a priority and the proposed public realm including tree removals is fundamentally about improving pedestrian amenity and access in the city. Looking at the um, existing condition of the footpath that um, the existing pedestrian crossing from the tram and across, if you like, the barrier that the tram creates from the um, south to the north side of uh, North Terrace is encumbered uh, by trees, by furniture, planting beds and service cabinets. So when, for example, the infrastructure for the tram was put in, it was put in for the existing situation, not for a longer term situation, which matches, if you like, the cultural um, boulevard. Looking at uh, the intentions of uh, the proposals, they're about improving pedestrian amenity. Um, this is important just to explaining where the existing bus stop sits outside the Sheridan and uh, Women's Health. So the North Terrace curb is cut in for the bus lay-by. The intention is to widen the footpath at this point and to uh, leave the bus stop in its current location. Dipti prefer this arrangement. Uh, the buses actually find it really difficult to get out of the bus stop back into the travel lanes. So it's preferred to, uh, to take them out and through that. As part of these works, four tram streetlight poles need to be relocated. And these are large poles which are holding up the wires for the tram. And part of the works will relocate those from where they would sit. You can see from the photo, in the centre of the footpath to the edge of the footpath, wouldn't work if they're in the uh, centre of the footpath. So those works are proposed as part of these improvements to the footpath. Looking at the other end of it, the east end of it, the kerb is reconstructed along the existing line of the kerb. You can see the tram there. The footpath width is increased to 4.5 to 5.6 metres, and that's from the edge of the tree grate for new street trees. So the footpath is actually wider than that, but there's a 4.5 to 5.6 unencumbered space, which is intended for both uh, pedestrians and cycling. The cultural boulevard section between Kintour and um, Frome works really well as a shared use space. So cyclists use it, access to the university users it, and pedestrians uh, use it. Looking at a cross section through that, it indicates where the line of the existing elms are. The intention is to replace that single line with a double line of semi-mature trees. A commitment's been made by Renewal um, SA to plant 6.5 metre high trees in their place. The difficulty in terms of uh, the footpath comes through a change of level on the property boundary with the existing retaining wall and then the location of the Sheridan building uh, itself. So 10 mature elms and one semi-mature plane tree are proposed for removal. Looking at uh, the intention of it, this is showing the two lines of uh, new trees. Uh, new granite paving on a concrete slab is proposed. Uh, why emphasise this is the uh, cultural boulevard section was not all of what was put on a concrete slab and a lot of it's failed. So it will be up to a standard that the city's now used in Gawler Place, Anzac Walk, Rundle Mall, all of which have worked really successfully. Extensive new uh, semi-mature tree planting and new street furniture and lighting. 
the existing cabinets, above ground cabinets and the tram infrastructure will be relocated outside of the line of the uh, footpath. Just in summary, uh, we're looking at realising the precinct four of the North Terrace Master Plan. The proposed works are summarised there. They look at a curb realignment at the existing bus stop to increase the footpath width to 4.9 to 5.6 metres clear for pedestrians and cyclists and Deputy has approved this new arrangement. It looks at the relocation of four tram and streetlight poles. I emphasise that because it's expensive to move them, uh, but they'll be moved as part of these works. The tram and other service cabinets will be relocated to unencumber the footpath. Uh, the location of new street furniture is consolidated, new granite paving on concrete slab to the City of Adelaide standards. Nine regulated and one significant tree are proposed for removal. In terms of the removal of the trees, the difficulty with these, these trees is that they are going to die at some stage. Uh, when, we don't know. We've got two different arborist reports, which you would have seen in through that, but they will die at some stage. The difficulty with them is they're not going to all die at once. Uh, they're going to die when, when they will. And through that, the difficulty is when do you take them out? So whether that decision is made now, it's made in five years time or 20 years time or whenever they die, it's difficult to know, but at some stage they will have to be removed. 12 new street trees are proposed to be planted within the verge, and there are 29 other new trees which are planted within the lot 14 uh, if you like, the current ledge to lot 14. So it's a total of um, 41 new semi-mature trees proposed for planting uh, to realise the, uh, these works. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We'll take some questions from elected members. Councillor Simpson. Thanks very much for um, coming to speak to us. Look, my questions mainly relate to the significant trees. Um, I understand there's more to the project than that, but I, I do want to ask a few questions about that. You talked a bit before about the uh, pedestrianisation of that area. I guess one of the things that I'm struggling to understand about the removal of the trees is that um, their position, their current positioning, and certainly with respect to the old hospital, was they were right out the front. You had people coming and going with uh, diverse needs in terms of access and mobility, and they seem to be able to coexist quite effectively. So why is it now in terms of improving pedestrian access that we need to get rid of the, the trees? Can you talk about that in a bit more detail? Yeah. Okay. I've got a few questions, Chair. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Councillor, and through that. The, the situation when the hospital was there was actually chaotic um, and uh, some would describe and I'd describe it as dangerous. People used to go out and sit on the low walls up there and smoke. You'd have the bus stop and you'd have an absolute craziness of people there and particularly because of the bus stop, it was a really busy place. What used to happen was people used to actually walk on the road. Uh, because it was so crowded during that section of it. Now, the situation, uh, because of the location of the trees and the garden beds and the arrangement of it, is still really tight. It's very difficult to take cycles uh, along there. As Lot 14 becomes busy, and it is going to become busy, I think 6,000 6, people are uh, expected on that side, the movement from the tram stop into the site is going to become even busier. So it was difficult before when it was a hospital in through that. I think now it's going to become difficult again when Lot 14 is populated again uh, with people coming there. And in terms of that movement, that accessibility, that safety, that equal access, the use of cyclists, um, what you have now will, will not really work in the future, uh, something needs to be done to improve it. You say it's dangerous. Were there any significant issues? Because I certainly didn't hear about that at the time. Um, I mean, I would have thought that a lot of the issues were to do with the layout of the street and the footpath rather than the trees 
they were there before the, that design. But are you aware of any specific issues? I think, I think that's a question for council and council. Okay, okay. yeah, no, that, that's yeah. fine. I might take that up with them. And um, the, the other issue, and this is more a question, I guess, from a design perspective, um, I think the point was made by yourself that um, through this development, you're aspiring to link the uh, botanic gardens in with the, the new um, development. And obviously, I, I share that um, aspiration, but wouldn't retaining these historic trees be in keeping with, with that in terms of linking in the, the history that's associated with the botanic gardens? And could this be accommodated from a design perspective? I mean, how much work would need to be done to accommodate the historic trees. I was conscious of the fact they've been there a long time, um, obviously, um, and uh, well before a lot of the kind of other buildings in the area and the issues that we're talking about today. Um, is there a way that they could be accommodated within the design? I think um, one of the challenges with retaining them is that um, one of our key goals is to get the uh, footpath pre-established and to uh, establish that with the new guidelines, which actually in terms of what we need to cut out, but actually damage the roots of the trees um, to establish the foundation for the new ground papers to go in. So um, if you were to retain the trees there, we'd actually question the viability of actually being able to replace, replace the papers at all. Um, and the other point that James had made earlier is that they will have a, a life that will expire sometime in the near future, whether that's five years, 10 years, the trees will tell us in the reports. And the, the opportunity is to replace them now with a, a broader piece of works. To do that on a staged basis in the future will be very challenging. Final question um, for you, and then I'll, I'll move on. The, you mentioned before about um, installation of mature and semi mature trees. How long would it take for um, you know, semi mature trees to reach the level of maturation that we've seen in terms of you know size and stuff like that um, as the existing trees. I mean, would we have to wait another hundred years before we get trees of the same size and shade in the city of Adelaide? I know, look, it looks, it's, a, it's a good question. The, the thing about the trees, when they were planted, that they didn't have the benefit of the um, the standards that you work under now. So what we do now is that we plant them with root barriers. Um, we plant them with good soils, and we plant them with irrigation. So all those factors <coughs> together means that these trees are going to grow well uh, in through that. When the trees were put in originally, that, that would just be put in, uh, and you know, which is why the pavements are in such poor condition, because all the roots are lifting them up, and we, you can't do anything about it now because the trees are so old. So in terms of what those trees would look like, if I compare the cultural boulevard trees and, and our standards are even higher then than when we planted those trees, is that a six and a half metre tall tree is a tall tree. It'll bush out and you'll get a level of shade along there uh, well within five years. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was very informative. Um, of course, part of me needs to point out that the principles of good stakeholder management would dictate that before this blew up in the media, we would have had this presentation. Um, but nevertheless, here we are. And, um, and thank you for giving us some detail around it. Um, just if I can share personally my experience, I used to catch the bus out from the old RA. And yes, it is, it is or was bedlam there, um, notwithstanding the, the um, a hospital gown clad people smoking out the front. There were obviously a couple of bus stops, lots of students, um, and it was a less than, trees. less than ideal situation. Um, so I do understand the difficulties with that footpath. Um, what I, I want to focus on though um, is uh, the tram, the tram supporting poles and that sort of thing. Now, now when I saw those poles go in, I was incensed because I thought it would have made sense to do what they did down King William Street. Um, and have it in the middle. Instead, we have this bird's nest arrangement of wires at the top. Um, now, just looking at the tracks, it doesn't look like there's room there, but, uh, and I know you're not Dipti staff, but it, would there be any scope to move those poles from the sidewalk and put them actually in the middle? Is it? Look, I, I think the arrangement's been done now, and to change it now would be really expensive. Possible. Yeah. Um, it, to actually move these poles is expensive in itself mm. in through that. Um, so I think that arrangement would be probably out of the question. Out of the question, yeah. yeah. I guess it's too late. Yeah, yeah the horse is well drawn that one. Um, and uh, 
the the materials from if I can get if I can get sort of a landscape architectural perspective on this, the materials that you're using on that side of the road would it make any sort of aesthetic sense to use those materials on the other side of the road as well, noting that that public realm also needs to be upgraded. Yeah, the the uh, city design manual actually lays out a strategy uh, for the materials on both sides of the road, and it's been sound. It's worked. Uh, the difficulty we have with all these things is, as I said, this started in 1994. So, you know, it's a long term and we need things like the LA Design Manual to set the standard and it is laid out what the material should be on both sides, but it's high quality materials on both sides of North Terrace. Yeah, okay. And this potential um, uh, new, new entrance or look at the Botanic Gardens, has that been, has that been fleshed out? Uh, any further yet? Have you firmed up on that or is that still in a state of flux? So it, it, at the moment we're putting a plan together, a, a broader plan for the whole North Terrace in front of Lot 14, which does include um, some ideas on how Botanic Gardens would be opened up. Um, our focus at the moment is Stage 1, which is the West End, all the way up to the, to the Vice Building, the last heritage building on the site. Um, what we'll need to know is understand more about the Aboriginal Cultural Gallery, how that will be designed, and the entrance to Botanic Gardens will be designed into that thinking um, in the coming, coming months. Okay, and do you know what stage the Cultural Gallery is up to then? Like where, where are they at? With the the government's still in the consultation stage with key stakeholders. Um, the Price Woodhouse Coopers have been appointed to do that work, and um, they still work to results of that now. Okay, and um, just as well, just turning attention while we're on it to uh, the public realm on Throne Road. Are you guys going to be upgrading all that as well, or? Look, the, the, the Lot 14 budget sits within the project boundary, which is on the land of regular sites. In this situation, we're looking to extend our capital expenditure out onto council land, which includes the full park footage, um, to get the maximum benefit of the project. Um, we don't have budget to upgrade Front Road. We're happy to have a discussion with council about um, the future aspirations for Front Road because it is an important link between the universities. Yes. Um, so that needs to be a conversation, future conversation, future conversation about budget contributions. Yeah, certainly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillors, any other questions? Councillor Martin. Look, I'm sorry, I was a second or two late for the presentation, but I wonder, have you got um, an illustration of what all of these improvements would look like with the existing trees? Uh, not not to retain the yes, existing trees. Yes, with all of those lighting, and uh, it would be a good comparison to see just how much of an impediment they are look if we could see an illustration of both. Um, the best I can probably show you is um, is is that uh, with the existing trees. So if you could, um, well, as as Mark said, is that it's, it's not possible to put the new granite paving in because of the excavation that's required to repave it. So theoretically, you could uh, take out. You know the season foreground and, and works like that, but you can't repay that uh, and get existing trees. What, uh, why is that? Because we as a council do that all the time. Uh, we have trees as old as this and we repay for all around them all of the time with great success. What, why would it not be possible for you? Yeah. With this, these are elm trees and like all trees, trees don't have tap roots, they have lateral roots and they're the things that they breathe and that hold them up. So the roots of any tree are in the first metre, uh, probably within the first half a metre and through that. So these trees, because of when they were planted without root barriers, the branches have gone out. If we went in there and excavated to put new paving in, we would be uh, potentially cutting all the lateral roots, which would potentially kill the tree in through that. So we couldn't do it in through that. So to actually repave there, you can't do now. The uh, elms that you've got, and elms are a difficult tree because of Dutch elm disease in through that. Uh, these ones have had branches fall. You have to manage them and the city manages them as well as they could. The elms that you've got are in grass. So you'll find them in the parklands in through that, uh, Prince Wales Gardens. So there are elm trees in the city, but I think you'll find most of them as I can think of anyway, I can't think of any in paving, are in grass, which is a different situation. If you're in paving, it, it's, it's harder for the 
tree because it's got to set out its lateral roots to get water and they go out further. Um, you know, we, uh, first thing we did is can we keep these trees, can you keep them uh, within the paving and still got new paving? The answer is no. Um, the, the paving you have in mind or no paving at all? Uh, the paving we have, in, sorry, the paving we have in mind is the standard that's set for the North Terrace, which is um, ground paving on a slab. So that requires an excavation of 450 to 500 millimetres, and through that, which uh, couldn't <coughs> occur around these trees. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Lord Mayor. Um, Thank you, Chair. Look, just for clarity around the question Councillor Martin asked, um, could I ask administration, is that something that we do, like repave around mature trees, and is that something that we do to that standard? Uh, through the Chair, uh, we wouldn't typically uh, repave around trees with a new paving um, uh, application. We may do uh, minor repairs and maintenance work um, around existing trees. But that's only in the case of just trying to maintain safety and reduce trip hazards around the current trees that we have in place. But for a new treatment, we would typically um, require the, the treatment that um, James has suggested. Okay. And this, the standard, James, that you're talking to is through the Adelaide Design Manual, yes. which is our yep. design manual. And just again, uh, so uh, to Councillor Martin's question, you did actually look at what that could be if you kept the trees and have looked at uh, the design of that area in initially. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Donovan, followed by Councillor Ramsay. Thank you for all of that information. Um, I accept that at no point was there along um, North Terrace, was there a designed separated bikeway from the previous um, design that you're now referring back to. However, now that we have a lot of information that um, that that is such a central boulevard for cycle traffic and that the majority of cycle traffic would hit destinations along there, all of the universities, all of the cultural um, institutions. Has any design been considered for this section of <coughs> North Terrace to install a separated bikeway, given at present very few cyclists use it in the sense of the intended shared path because there's so many pedestrians along there and they are moving in a haphazard fashion and so it's not an ideal space for a shared yeah. path. Yeah, yeah. Has any design been considered along that section, linking into Chrome? Yeah, okay. The, the city has a, a cycle strategy through that. It doesn't actually um, identify North Terrace as one of the major routes in through that. Ideally, you'd put a um, cycleway on the road, uh, which is protected in through that. Because of the tram stop in through that and the physical space it's taken up, it's squeezed down to an absolute minimum in through that. Um, so the running lanes are actually the minimum that you can get away with in North Terrace. Um, so there isn't room to put one on road. The, it's a pragmatic solution that seems to have worked well between Frame and uh, Kentor having a shared use space in through that. What we've done in this is absolutely maximise the width of the footpath and taken out as much that encumbers it, and unfortunately the trees are part of the elms are part of that encumbrance and through that to allow a shared use space along there. So we've actually squeezed it as much as possible to get as wide as we can. And the outcome of around five metres is actually a good outcome. So has there ever been considered on the footpath a separated bikeway? Uh, no. No, there's no design at any point that was not that I know. It's always been thought of as a shared use space. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillor Abraham Zeta. Councillor Hyde, you've already asked a question. Councillor, I need to wrap this up. Uh, I'll be quick. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, James, can I just um, uh, confirm, did you say you were involved um, with the master plan back in 94 when it first started? That's a sketch up there, I drew. Ah, excellent. It's probably worthwhile noting that uh, we'll, uh, it's good to have the, the original author here, so uh, that ensures that we will get some consistency uh, throughout the project. Um, but I didn't see any uh, any plans of uh, overlaps of current trees and proposed trees. Do you have anything like that that you could circulate to us? Yes, yeah, do. Um, uh, and also, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, I'm sort of getting the gist that uh, dealing with these trees now is in a way um, 
uh, in a way, it's horticultural preventative maintenance. Would, would I be correct in assuming that? Um, could, could you say it again? <laughs> horticultural preventative maintenance, that if, that's, if that's one way to put it. I think um, you're putting words on his mouth, Councillor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just if I get, if I get you, yes, look, any, any urban tra tree needs management in through that, and at some stage, management becomes impossible. So in Melbourne, a couple of weeks ago, an elm tree branch fell on, first walking through the um, Melbourne parklands and killed them. And that couldn't be prevented. So no matter what the city does in terms of testing, preventive maintenance, trees need management and they're not as predictable in through that. Now with these trees, we don't know how long they're going to last. We've got two different arborist reports uh, for us. Some say they'll be five years, some are 20 years. We, we don't know, but at some stage they will require replacement. They, they need management. Thank you. I guess what I was trying to get at is that uh, there will be some sort of cost involved later on down the track in removing these trees, and that cost could be a human life. So that's what oh. I wanted to get at. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, so, Councillor just, just very quickly, very quickly. Um, so this, this slideshow has been provided to our administration. Can I get an undertaking that we get a copy of that to consider this further? Is that okay? Yes, yes. it's included in the minute, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, yep, there's none. Thank you very much for your time, for your presentation today. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we'll move on to item 4.2 members' presentation uh, also on infrastructure update. Thank you. Through Chair and thank you members. Um, we have uh, an infrastructure update for you, um, in particular relating to the heavy vehicle bypass requirements. Um, this presentation is to provide an operational update to Council on information relating to the management of our three bridges in the city. Um, two of these bridges, Albert uh, Bridge and the Adelaide Bridge, are State Heritage listed. Um, each and every week we have requests under the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. Uh, they come to us for heavy vehicles to access the city. On all occasions we, we avoid our bridges and we, um, in most cases, disallow these vehicles to enter the city. What we're informing Council on tonight is our more permanent control measure um, in relation to heavy vehicles access in the city. And Mason Willis is here from our asset management team and he's got um, some information to present to you to explain uh, exactly what we need to undertake. Thanks, Mason. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. And yet, yeah, I'm the asset manager here for our bridge assets. Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll dive straight in. So Adelaide Bridge is a major transport route through Adelaide. As, as we all know, it gets um, 33,000 vehicles per day use the bridge. It was built in 1930. It's in fair to average condition for its age, but this condition is deteriorating as assets of this type do, and it is approaching the end of its useful life. So it was uh, widely agreed in the industry of these assets that a, a bridge structure of its type, Adelaide Bridge, would last about 100 years. Um, so we're currently working with key stakeholders to implement a heavy vehicle bypass in Adelaide, which ultimately comprises load restrictions on three bridges, Adelaide, Victoria Bridge and Albert Bridge. And as Clinton mentioned, Adelaide and Albert Bridge are heritage listed assets. So the key questions, so why is a heavy vehicle bypass being proposed? Um, each of the three bridges currently permit modern vehicles that weigh far more than what they were designed to take. So if we use Adelaide Bridge as an example, built in 1930, the vehicles that currently use that bridge didn't exist then, so modern standards have changed. And as such, as an asset manager, we have to think very carefully about how the asset is used. Adelaide Bridge is nearing the end of its useful life. It was constructed in 1930 and the condition is deteriorating. So what we're proposing here and what is required is a key risk mitigation strategy. 
what vehicles will be impacted. It's expected, anticipated, that heavy construction traffic and special vehicles over 26 tonnes. So normal cars, buses, emergency vehicles, waste collection vehicles will not be affected. What are the benefits of a heavy vehicle bypass? It will enable the council and the administration to manage these assets, complex assets, over the remaining years of their life. Um, it will also, very importantly, improve the residential and commercial community of North Adelaide by redirecting heavy vehicles to the ring route, which exists around Adelaide. It's called the R1 on some maps. Um, what community engagement will take place? A communications plan has been developed to explain the heavy vehicle bypass and communicate its purpose, and this will include relevant government agencies and industry. So, a bit of background to where we are today. In 2016, a load rating assessment was undertaken by GHD, an external technical consultant, and it identified a potential risk uh, presented by Adelaide Bridge compared to modern standards. So the vehicles the bridge were, was taking um, uh, culminated in a risk to council. This is not what it was designed to take. So a load restriction of 26 tonnes has been recommended for the bridge as a risk mitigation strategy. Um, so as a means of limiting the heavy vehicle use of council owned bridges, a heavy vehicle bypass will be implemented on Adelaide, Victoria and Albert Bridge. So just to give you an idea of what is allowed, current vehicles, the, the Bendy bus, which is the largest of the buses, uh, the ambulances, the image on the right there is the heaviest fire service appliance that they have. That's their crane vehicle that weighs 26 tonnes. So these are permitted, these aren't affected. But what we're really looking at here with this load restriction of vehicles such as these, but not limited to these, we're really trying to target heavy vehicle, heavy construction traffic, traffic that we can say quite clearly and definitely that we don't, we don't need, the, the bridge can't take these, these, these kinds of loads, freight, heavy freight. So a heavy vehicle bypass, what is that? It directs heavy vehicles over, in this case, over 26 tonnes to use an alternative route. There are a number of them in South Australia. There's one in Port Adelaide, there's one in Murray Bridge. It would limit heavy vehicle use of council-owned bridges. It will improve the residential and commercial community of North Adelaide by redirecting these heavy vehicles to the ring road. And it lessens impacts on other council-owned assets, such as roads and stormwater infrastructure, simply by re-diverting or re redirecting these heavy vehicles away from these assets. So again on a heavy vehicle bypass, so in North Adelaide there are seven major entrance routes here, nominated by the stars there. Um, what this map is intending to show is that there is a ring route, the blue dotted line, which we've uh, shown to also include North Terrace there. Vehicles can access the city and North Adelaide but they don't need to use these three bridges. The bridges really act as, as a thoroughfare, if you like, but um, they weren't designed to do that. Heavy vehicles can access North Adelaide. Obviously, there'll always be construction work going on there, but they must exit the way that they've entered. They don't need to use the bridges. So just to give you an example of a scenario, so a 60 tonne truck here, like this one in the image, uh, needs to deliver steel, for example, to the festival centre complex. This is a real world example that's developing now, uh, down there. Um, the this is a restricted access vehicle. This is what it would be classified as, and it must contact the NHVR, the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator that Clinton mentioned earlier, to confirm its route. So the purpose of that body is to regulate freight traffic in Australia. Um, so currently, the City of Adelaide would deny access for any overmass vehicle over these bridges anyway. So we don't allow this anyway. An alternative route must be found. So this is an existing control that's already in place. So the arrows show here under this scenario where to get to uh, where it needs to go, it would have to use the ring route, it can still get there. So under scenario two, same truck, 60 tonnes, this is a restricted access vehicle, it must contact the NHVR to ensure its route's okay, but it doesn't do this. So this can happen in the real world. So it's a, it's a legal requirement to do this, but some vehicles may not. So that puts a direct risk uh, to the council and to our assets. And we need, this is a significant risk to infrastructure, and we need a, a way to mitigate this risk. So in the box there, there's a significant risk that overmass vehicles may use the bridge without knowledge of the regulator. This can happen. So with a heavy vehicle bypass, scenario three, 
there we go, the same truck. Adelaide Bridge is not able to take these vehicles to get to the festival centre complex. So the driver at the top of the image there would reach an entry point in North Adelaide and it would be notified by signage to use the heavy vehicle bypass route, which is the ring route, the dotted line there, to get to its destination. So the signage, and there'd be a number of levels of signage explaining the details of what's required here, would tell the driver uh, that it can't use these bridges as access. It must find an alternative route. And this is in addition to the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. So it's an additional control. So just to finalise, this is really a multi-control approach to managing assets. Um, yep, seven major routes into North Adelaide. They can still be used if required in North Adelaide for local traffic, but they must exit the same way. So why are we doing this? There is a strategic alignment to uh, this um, infrastructure management strategy. In the Smart Move strategy of the Council, uh, it outlines Council's desired transport and movement outcomes for the city, and a key priority is to create a people-friendly city by improving conditions for pedestrians and cyclists. Under the efficient services outcome, the strategy aims to create a city where freight deliveries are efficient and not disruptive to other street users. Uh, the North Adelaide Local Area Traffic and Parking Management Plan. Now, when this was undertaken, community consultation results didn't reveal that heavy vehicle traffic was an issue in North Adelaide, but we would like to keep it that way and ensure that where it isn't necessary, the heavy vehicle should use the ring room. Uh, we have a CBD access strategy. This is being developed now. Uh, it'll be ready in the next six months, but it's a great opportunity there to, to tie this in to the intentions of this bypass. And finally, uh, City of Adelaide has a city plan, which is uh, focused on integrated infrastructure planning. So that's a part of this. So this isn't standalone. This would work with other um, infrastructure strategic goals, such as stormwater location and um, asset renewal. So enforcing of the heavy vehicle bypass. So a heavy vehicle bypass really is a series of controls. Strategically placed signage is one, one element. And the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator um, have informed us that they can assist with this. They have uh, traffic inspectors that go out if we suspect that our assets are being used um, against what we've informed the community to use them as. Uh, they send out traffic inspectors who actually uh, can find businesses uh, where we have evidence that this is uh, not being followed. And also we have an internal control with our city works permits. So to undertake construction work in the city, you need a permit from the council and these permits will be updated to state that, yes, you can do this work, but this is not an authorised route um, over the three bridges. Stakeholder engagement, as you can imagine, this is quite a large uh, stakeholder engagement piece and community engagement piece. Analysis has been done and the vast majority of stakeholders have been contacted to inform at this stage. Um, the bulk of stakeholders are analysed to really be in the low power, high interest category. Of course, they're interested, but the council owns these assets and ultimately we can set the rules as to how they're used. Um, stakeholders yet have been engaged and will continue to be engaged. Key stakeholders in this table here, DIPTI, a number of departments of DIPTI have been engaged. They're aware and they support this, they can help. And the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator is aware our works permits team also aware, ready to make changes. And at the bottom here, the festival centre complex. So they've been contacted. So this is a heavy construction concern in the CBD at the moment, adjacent to Adelaide Bridge. So they're a key stakeholder and they, they had to be informed and they have, and um, they, they've given in principle support for what we're doing here, understanding that it's, it's difficult to, to manage an asset in this way with heavy construction traffic. So, and finally, this is just a very brief uh, a diagram showing the plan of action here. Um, so we've got, we've, we're in our stakeholder engagement phase at, at the moment, but we will shortly move into implementation, which is installation of our signs, amendment of our, perms, our permits, which results in full implementation by the 27th of September. Um, obviously, that's not the end of an initiative like this. There'll be ongoing monitoring, which we'll do internally to ensure its success. Uh, traffic counts are being undertaken next week to determine vehicle numbers and we'll do that again after implementation of the bypass. Um, that's one measure for us to see if this has been successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the very thorough presentation of uh, Councillor Martin and the by Councillor Hope. Yeah, look, thanks. That was uh, uh, 
quite a lot of information. Um, and I must say, I'm reminded of that childhood nursery rhyme, uh, London Bridge is falling down. <laughs> Are the kids in the city going to have to sing Adelaide Bridge is falling down? I mean, is there a chance that it may? Um, so, no, so... Well, if a heavy truck, 26 to 60 tonnes, goes over the bridge. Yeah. So how I can answer that is, what this measure is intended to do is reduce it is to uh, take a unlikely scenario down to a very unlikely scenario. The only way you can do that is by implementing a risk mitigation strategy such as this. The bridge is in a fair to average condition for its age, but that's not to be alarmed. There's no alarm there because an asset of this age can be expected to be in that condition. However, we're in quite a unique phase of the asset life now where we are uh, learning and working with stakeholders to determine the long-term plan for this bridge. And so do you have any idea by how many years the life of the bridge will be extended by limiting the load? Yeah, um, sorry, uh, it's not intended to extend the life of the bridge. So what this is intended to do is to maximise the remaining years of this bridge. What must happen concurrently is internal planning to understand the long term plan for replacement of Adelaide Bridge. This can't stand alone. And that's a, a near to medium term project? Uh, yes, yes, it, it will. Near to medium term, yes. Okay. And just one other question. Um, given that truckies are notorious for ignoring all rules, uh, how significant are the penalties that would discourage them from continually breaching the heavy vehicle ban? Um, that's a really good question. That's the one question I didn't ask the NHVR what the financial penalty is, the amount, but the NHVR are insistent that they want to stamp out this kind of behaviour. Um, I'm confident that, that they'll help us in this, but sadly, sorry, I don't know the financial penalty. There. It's a regulator in the same way as the EPA, so prosecutions do happen. Um, to give you an example, uh, Birkenhead Bridge down Port Adelaide Way that recently has had a load restriction placed upon it. And the reason for that is they had a deck failure. So an element of the bridge actually failed and they had no option but to uh, implement a load restriction. This is intended to manage the asset before anything like that happens. Thank you. Councillor Hyde. Thank you for that very thorough presentation. And I just want to start by commending administration for getting GHD to do that review. Of course, it reminds me of the state government who only started looking at their bridges once they started falling down. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Um, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, I understand the two sort of older, more heritage sort of bridges um, might be approaching the end of their life, but is Victoria Bridge, that's a lot newer. Yes. Isn't it? But, but you're still proposing to have heavy vehicle restrictions on it? So Victoria Bridge has challenges of its own. It's a, uh, it's a large concrete structure over the Torrens there. We're managing that um, appropriately as well. In order to maximise the benefit of a heavy vehicle bypass such as this, we're intending to incorporate Victoria Bridge because we don't want to load that bridge and the adjacent Morford Bridge with these heavy vehicles which would ultimately take that path. It's not intended to do that. We'd be presented with another problem then. Um, so really to incorporate three bridges is to say, no, we're holistically managing our assets. There's a ring route, please use the ring route. You can get to where you need to go. Um, the benefits outweigh the, the potential uh, uh, inconvenience. Yeah. Okay, understood, thank you. Um, and uh, with Adelaide Bridge, I think I saw up there a, a lifespan of 100 years and it was built in 1930. So are we saying that it's got basically another decade left? And that's about it. Yep, so these are nominal um, lifespans. When we work in asset management, some cars go on for far longer than they should. You know, you're surprised when you see them. But the age of an asset and its lifespan is very much a function of how it's used. So in the case of a bridge built in 1930, its age will be diminished if it's used in a manner that was not intended. So hence why this isn't expected to extend its life. Um, so going back to your question, yes, 10 to 15 years left of, yeah. of Adelaide Bridge. Yeah. Um, ballpark figure on replacement costs, you know, how much a new bridge would cost? Um, tomorrow's morning, 15 years um, no. no, no, sorry, don't have a replacement cost, obviously it's a large heritage asset, um, 
But um, no, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. That's, sorry, that's, sorry. Uh, that's a that's a that's a bigger piece of work. Um, this might be a question for other people in administration, um, just generally. But when these bridges were built, uh, probably not the Albert Bridge, but the Adelaide Bridge and and the uh, um, Victoria Morva Bridge. Um, uh, was there federal state government funding involved in building those bridges or did we undertake those projects by ourselves because they're quite large projects through the chair um i don't know the exact origins of, of the question you're asking but I'm, I'm happy to take that on notice and, and find out a bit more information about the original um funding and, and ownership models around those bridges. Yeah, I think that would be very valuable to us moving forward. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor. We have uh, Councillor Miranda, do you still want to ask a question? I did, um, because um, I'm nervous about this um, idea that it's going to die in 15, 20 years. I mean, in Europe, the bridges that was built on those lines last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why is this bridge going to have to be replaced. Uh, and just to add to that, 20 years ago, we spent well over a million dollars completely renovating the bridge. Was that just sort of cosmetic or? Yeah. Um, so that work that was undertaken in 98, that was concrete um, repair. Mm -hmm. So really it formed part of what you could um, term, say, ongoing maintenance or refurbishment of the bridge. Yes. Again, it wouldn't have extended its life in any way. when. Uh, the reference there to European bridges, we really are, it's hard to compare apples and apples to some modern bridges are built to modern standards. Mm -hmm. Adelaide Bridge was built to the standards of the day. But when you go to Europe, you see bridges much older than that, um, still coping. Yeah, yeah. So and a really, now yeah. It's going to. Yeah, so a really good example of that, which is in the news recently, is the Hammersmith Bridge in mm -hmm. London. It's just been closed. So it is exactly in the category that you've mentioned there. It's owned by the local authority there. They don't have enough money to re repair this bridge. They appealed to Westminster down the road. They said no, so they closed the bridge. So the scenario you're describing does exist. There are older bridges out there. Um, yeah, it is hard. I mean, we replaced all the under the slate. We redid all that put new slate on the thing, which was a really extensive thing. Anyway, that's the idea. I'm very, we'll argue that in 15 or 20 years time. Yes. So it was a big, um, big project. Um, I Councillor Moran, are you asked, making a comment or a question? A comment now. The uh, trucks down um, O'Connell Street are, uh, are causing a problem, so I'm glad that they're being rerouted. Um, I had my card all ripped off by a one they showed yeah. me. Um, so I'm glad they're, <laughs> I'm glad they're going. Um, but uh, yes, we need to. Would, do you want the businesses to report or anything like that? Um, um, that surveillance of trucks going down there because they scream down there. Yeah. So I suppose it's important to know that it's not a ban of heavy vehicles in North Adelaide, but it's a redirection where they don't. If they're using North Adelaide as a thoroughfare, that's the behaviour we're trying to stop. There's they a certainly are. Okay. Yeah. So with this, with this is a benefit. Of that. In terms of businesses, it's a tough one that because um, unless they're in direct violation of what we're trying to impose, a heavy vehicle can be in North Adelaide, it just can't use the bridge if it's over a certain weight. If a business reported that, we might have to investigate and... If it's coming up at Connell Street, that would... Councillor Moran, I think we're starting to move into an interrogatory process. No, I'm just asking a question. If it's on Connell Street, it would have had to go over the bridge, wouldn't it? Does your room... Oh, sorry, coming from north, it yeah. won't have crossed the bridge yet. So Is that coming from south? Oh, absolutely. It, it can yeah, only so cross the bridge. So even on O'Connor Street going yeah. north would have had to have been violation? Uh, if it's over 26 tonnes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, councillors. With that, we will conclude our presentation. Thank you very much. Very well done. Thank you. Okay, um, the item 4.3 has been withdrawn by the CEO, the LGA CEO value proposition. Oh, no. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was uh, were you excited about it, Councillor? I can bring it back if you want. No, bring it back. Um, yeah, so the CEO decided to withdraw that. So we'll move on to item 4.4, the implementation of the sustainable event guidelines. That's something that's had already uh, come through Council. Um, I'm happy to take this presentation as read uh, if all councillors are prepared to go through it. It's completely up to you. It's something we've seen already. So. Uh, 
be happy to uh, move the. Um, this is just the. There's nothing to move, Councillor. Did you have any questions? What's been... Okay. Any questions, members? We're very sorry to keep you with us. <laughs> I'll ask a question. Thank yes. you very much. Have you enjoyed this? <laughs> okay, we'll move on to um, <laughs> item. So, item 4.5 uh, City of Adelaide Lighting Strategy that's also been withdrawn by the CEO. Oh, no. Taking a look at it. Councillor Moran. Would you like me to? Would you like to bring it in? Is that? No, no. Are you not complaining, mate? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. We'll move on to item five, uh, five point one, strategic property matter, the unsolicited proposal, status update, and I'll hand over to the CEO for a quick preamble before we um, deal with this item. Okay. Thanks, through you, Chair. Um, this is an opportunity for Council to publicly note the progress of the unsolicited proposal and um, one that's been put forward by the Adelaide Football Club. For the record, we're now progressing stage two of that policy and um, I must uh, recognise there's been a, a degree of impatience of not yet providing information to our community. Uh, I recognise that. But I must say we're getting much closer to being able to provide that information and also to explain to the community the process and the timeframes, that kind of stuff. This is, as you know, the very first proposal being processed underneath, under the provisions of the unsolicited proposal policy. And that was you know, adopted by council over 12 months ago. Um, we're now at a point where the Adelaide Football Club have advanced their concept mapping or their planning. And I anticipate they will formally lodge the concept plans in the very near future. Um, I stress that you know, a lot of work will be undertaken by Council prior to any decisions being made. Um, but the, the intent tonight is kind of threefold. First of all, just to note the progress of stage two of the unsolicited proposal process as submitted by the LA Football Club. Secondly, to note that the needs analysis is being undertaken on the future aquatic facility requirements. And thirdly, that we note that the community engagement proposal is being developed. It's going to be used for community engagement and that will be formally referred to you for endorsement. Um, just to clarify with you that community engagement will occur when we've got, when we've fully, uh, when we've actually received a formal proposal from the LA Football Club and that when we've agreed the community engagement plan, that's when we'll commence the engagement process. Um, once the needs analysis has been undertaken and we receive feedback from our community, council members will be in a position to make an informed decision at that time. And I'll stress that should the concept be considered acceptable to council, as we've called, talked about, a full design, um, a full uh, cost analysis and a business case and operating model will be created and, and determined uh, for you to consider. So there's a fair bit of work to be undertaken before any final decisions could ever be made. Um, but the, the, it's important tonight, I guess, to focus on those three key areas of, of the report um, for consideration. I do need to remind you of the confidentiality requirements. I just want to be sure that you don't inadvertently um, divulge any information that's been presented previously. But tonight it's fairly clear the three key items are for consideration. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, CEO. Uh, just one second, Councillor Moran. Um, members, uh, as the CEO stated, we have a recommendation before us at the moment. Uh, the recommendation is to note uh, both those stages, and um, I will firstly look for a mover and a seconder. Can I ask a question first? I'm going to take a mover and a seconder first to go into formal, and then there's an opportunity for you to do that, Councillor. Is there a mover and a seconder for this motion? Moved by Councillor Abraham Zeta, seconded by Councillor Hyde. Do you wish to speak to your motion? Right? Okay. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Hyde? Reserve. Councillor Moran, you have the floor. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll not just speak to the motion then. Um, do, you want to, do you want to take your mic off, please? Thank you. I won't be voting for this because while what the um, CEO has said that there'll be consultation, the consultation will come after a fully formed plan has been lodged. 
Now, I want to go out to my ratepayers in North Adelaide and ask them to have input into what we want the um, crows to do. After all, they're the people most affected, the businesses and the residents in North Adelaide. What we're doing is denying um, our, the people that pay our rates and will be affected any ability to say, well, this is what we want. We want one building, three buildings, four buildings. We don't want it at all. We da da da. Um, it, I think it's insulting to our, um, I think how we're doing it's insulting to our councillors and I've been very, very offended by the, um, the attitude of the administration tonight in the uh, rather roughshod um, behaviour about confidentiality. Um, and I think that we're offending our ratepayers by not bringing them into the kind. It is their land, it is their facility, and we are their representatives. To a degree, I admit, and as Sam's often said, you know, we were elected to, to, to uh, govern, but this is a really, really deep in the trenches issue. This is putting a private club on the parklands, pulling down a facility that we built, presumably, and replacing it with a private club. This is something that we have not been mandated to do. None of us ran at the election saying we were going to sell a portion of the parklands off. If we had, we could just go ahead and govern, but we haven't been. And this is one that the ratepayers of Adelaide will be very keen to have an input. Uh, and I can assure the, um, the public that the councillors haven't had much of an input. Our briefings have been skimpy. Um, we have not been provided any notes and um, I think the whole thing that's happened is very, very upsetting. I entered council 25 years ago and this site was, uh, the parkland was a major issue. And I, the same as this for everybody sitting here. Most of you had on your, um, your electoral material, you would protect the parklands. Now, it might be a good idea to go ahead with this, but you have to check. After promising people that you'd protect the parklands, I think it's incumbent on you to go to them and say, hang on, do you, want, do you want us to proceed with this? And if you do want us to proceed with this, what, what things would you like? We can't represent them because we haven't asked them that question. Now the administration and the council is tying our hands together. Um, I took a photo for my own use of, of uh, briefing that we had earlier so that I could read it at leisure because I cannot read 25 pages of fine print up there and make a cogent decision. I was reprimanded and basically accused of... No, how is this um, relevant? It is relevant in how I feel about why we're keeping this a secret. Uh, and the attitude yes. of the council is secretive on an issue that is of public part land, it is the very thing we shouldn't be secretive of. The other item, yes, we should be. That's commercial in confidence. This isn't. We only have one, one tender. So, um, and I regret the day that we were talked into doing this unsolicited bid. <coughs> we thought it was dodgy at the time, and it's proved to be a very worrisome thing. I think this whole process is disappointing. I urge you to vote against this motion and release the little we know to the public and ask for their views, because you're just their representatives. You're not anything else. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims. Yeah, I'm also uh, not happy with how this has been um, been unfolding. I do want to put on um, record my concerns about the confidential way in which this has been handled. Um, this is you know, a proposal for a corporate takeover of the slab of our parklands. And I think we should be having those discussions in public. This is public land. It belongs to the people of Adelaide. And the people of Adelaide have a right to be consulted. And back in May, I proposed that before we went down this path, that we actually stopped and had a chat with the community, consulted with residents and ratepayers about what we should do. At the time, I was criticised and told that it was a stunt. It wasn't a stunt, it was a legitimate um, approach and one I think the community would have welcomed because it's public land, they have a right to have a say. And 
we've got a proposal for a corporate takeover of part of our parklands and the community are not even able to get access to the information about what's being proposed. And I think that's a real travesty for local democracy. And I think the unsolicited bid process has not been the appropriate mechanism to look at this. And um, it's hamstrung council. It's made it very difficult for us to have open discussions with our community. I'm also really concerned about this proposal and the fact that we're looking at uh, noting that we're commissioning a needs analysis whilst we're still progressing with this process. And my view is we should be pausing this process whilst we wait for the outcome of the needs analysis so that we know uh, what our needs are and the community needs are in terms of the uh, demand for the aquatic centre and recreational services. Why would we would be progressing um, something like this when we haven't even worked out what um, our needs are and the needs of our community are uh, is beyond me. I think this is a deeply flawed process. It's anti-democratic and um, I think really we are flouting public opinion on this and we've been turning up our noses. This council has turned up its noses to the uh, residents and ratepayers of the city of Adelaide. It is public land and the public has a right to be consulted. Parklands belong to everybody. They don't just belong to corporations or commercial entities. And in fact, we shouldn't be giving away free land. So I'm very unhappy about this process and I urge councillors to think again before we go down this path. Thank you, Councillor Sims. I'm the Lord Mayor, then Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Chair. Look, I, I uh, have actually spoken to some of the members as well about uh, wishing that we could go public right now. However, we are in an unsolicited bid process. It's an endorsed process by council. That is the process we're in for good or bad. It's the first time we've actually used the unsolicited bid process because it's the first time we've actually had to be to have been approached by someone for something like that. I totally agree. It is public land and we will be consulting with our community as soon as we have a proposal. Uh, what we've seen so far is stage one, which is a concept and we have not seen a proposal which will come back in. We do need to consult. It is public land. Everybody is completely mindful of that, but we are in the middle of a process a, that is a documented process. And until we actually get to the next stage of that process, we can't go public. We are bound by confidentiality. And I would ask members to please be mindful that we are bound by our own policy. The policy does need review. That's fine. We can do that when we've got the other end and we can actually review what the process that we went through and then we can make amendments should we wish to. And I'll just remind the reason the uh, unsolicited bid process came into being at the first place was off the Wingfield debacle um, and the state government put an unsolicited bid process in and council did too to protect us and to protect the process and to protect the, um, the rights of the individuals within the process and the council members. So I agree. I agree that we should actually be going out to consultation. We will be going out to consultation. We're doing all the right things in terms of getting the needs analysis, finding out actually what's out there, what we need to do, if we need to keep going, and uh, hopefully we'll move through this process fairly swiftly and be out to our community as soon as possible. Thank you, Mayor Councillor Hope. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose a couple of things um, I would say is that uh, the, the first one is that this bid, this process that we're going through is something that has been touched on was approved by council. And of course, uh, it, it baffles me that some of those councillors who have previously wanted to butcher this process were of course councillors who were last term uh, elected to go with this process as our policy. Um, uh, so it seems like a bit of a backflip in that sense. Um, that confuses me. But, but what, what I will say um, is, that, is, is that there will be opportunity for community consultation. In fact, the community consultation is built into this process and it is, it is the arguably the most important part. Um, the reason, to my thinking, that it's taken so long to get here 
um, or to get even to stage two, and it will take even longer to get to a formulated proposal that we can then take to the community, is because uh, the council and the administration have been approaching this with significant caution, uh, because we uh, we don't want to put a foot wrong when we're dealing with it. Um, that's why it's taken so long. And, and with everything that's happened to date, I'm quite comfortable with, and of course I'm quite comfortable with it as well, because we can back out at any time if we're unsatisfied uh, with what's happening. Um, now, with the process, I'm broadly satisfied. Um, uh, I, think we, I think we should push on um, because I think there is a real opportunity here to take a space, and that space is currently commercialised. You want to talk about exclusivity. There is currently an exclusive club that sits there on Park 2. It's called the Adelaide Aquatic Centre, and yes, you do have to pay to go in there. So it's not just open to everyone. You do have to pay to go in there. I paid to go in there the other day, in fact. Um, so, so, so what we what we're talking about is is a site that's currently commercialised. It's just commercialised remarkably poorly um, because of bad decisions of previous councils over many many years, arguably. So, um, uh, so, so we're already dealing with a commercialised site. What what we've got before us and and potentially down the track is an opportunity uh, for us uh, uh, to deal with that site. Uh, in, a, in a better way and in fact potentially open more of it up to the community um, and to actually have a net reduction in alienation of the parklands. Now, uh, Councillor Sims spoke about, uh, uh, about uh, councillors turning their nose up to the idea of community consultation, um, but I would say the people that want to butcher this process have, have only turned their nose up to this particular part of the parklands being uh, more in line with what Colonel White envisaged. Um, which is uh, more of an open green space. Now, this this uh, huge uh, uh, metal glass pyramid that's currently there is not in line with Colonel Light's vision, um, uh, but a more open and, and greener space would be. So, um, uh, so I would say to councillors that that's the real that's the real that's the real that's the real, that's the real value. Councillors, councillors, I I'll call it. He is not repeating any confidential information. He is referencing guiding principles that were made public by this council. Oh, Councillor, right. councillors, if the decision's final, please finish, Councillor. I, I would just say that that's that's what I'm in it for. That net reduction of parkland alienation um, is ultimately the goal here. Councillor Moran and Councillor Martin, read your papers. It's, it's part of our guiding principle yes, that we've requested we that information. That Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, it is not. Councillor Moran, we're finished. Councillor Hart, are you done? Would any other councillor like to speak? Councillor Martin, please go ahead. Look, I'm sorry, I missed the insult. I honestly, I missed the insult. Councillor Councillor Kuros, it's not your turn to speak. It's Councillor Martin. No, no, no. And councillors, please, just as a set rule, when a councillor is speaking, please do not interrupt. That is the least we can do. Councillor Moran, I am being very serious. If you want the respect of the chamber, please provide it back. Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Please speak, Councillor. Look, Chair, I appreciate um, your remarks to councillors, but the, the problem is that the offensive remarks are becoming thick and fast. And it's not acceptable. Mayor. No, and from the other councillors okay. suggesting that all of the ills of the Aquatic Centre are attributable to former councillors, and indeed the nods that went on on the other side were quite offensive. What's even more offensive is the disingenuous remarks about how we're going to go out there and consult. We're going to talk to people. We're going to ask them what they think. We are not. We are going to consider a proposal, and when the deal is done, we'll ask the ratepayers what they think about it. That is not consultation. That is a process that hoodwinks them into believing that they will have a say. It is disingenuous in the extreme. The other two points are these two processes that have been singled out for discussion. There are real needs for those to be made uh, the subject of reform here in this council. The uh, unsolicited bid process was presented to us as a means by which different proposals for a piece of council property could be judged and evaluated. This is a single bid from a single proponent for a piece of public land to a publicly elected body. And somehow there's a veil of commercial confidentiality drawn across it. Yeah. 
this unsolicited bid process needs to be scrapped. And if it is not reformed, then I will move in this council very shortly that we do scrap it. And the needs analysis is the most extraordinary initiative on the part of a council that for some years now has known that there has been a problem with the aquatic centre. We were told in no uncertain terms as the crow's bid came to us, the aquatic centre is stuffed. And yet for 10 years before, our administration did nothing about a needs analysis, nothing to see what was required when the old state swim centre collapsed. They did nothing about inquiring what the future might look like for an aquatic centre in the city of Adelaide. But now that the crows are interested in that block of land, we're going to do a needs analysis. Now, if Councillor Sims doesn't move it, at the next council meeting, I will be moving that this entire unsolicited bid process is paused until we complete the needs analysis. It is putting the cart before the horse to go through the process and to then produce a needs analysis, which merely confirms the outcome that's coming early next year. Uh, look, I urge everyone here to think very carefully about this. This decision, if it proceeds to what looks like the likely outcome, and we've already had the Lord Mayor on record saying, why wouldn't we look at this if it's got community facilities, if it's got water sports, if it's got sports fields, why wouldn't we look at it? No, that is true. that is a confirmed position. And you're taking that position will not stand you in good stead with the community. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillors, would anyone else like to speak? Uh, point of order, I actually think that me saying why wouldn't we look at it, which is actually what we are doing, the process that we are currently in, Lord Mayor, your point of order is, is why wouldn't I say, why wouldn't we look so at it? It doesn't mean you agree with it. You're That's saying, why correct. It's no, not so we'll look point, at point it. Of, point of order, Chair. I'm, I'm being misrepresented it's here. Not these, a, it's not these a very Lord, 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 Lord Mayor, you've called a point of order. That is done. Councillor Martin, would you like to explain yourself? Yes, the Lord Mayor's words were on ABC television. Quote, if it involves recreation and sporting facilities, community facilities, pools, AFL football grade ovals, and all of the sport that comes with that, then I don't see why we wouldn't support that. Not look at it, support that. That's our perception problem. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Point made. Councillor Hyde, you are summing up. So you, just a question. Uh, yeah, just a question of administration. Councillor Martin said um, uh, that we would not be going to consultation until the quote deal was done. End quote. Can we elaborate on the unsolicited bid proposal and whether that statement is correct? Yeah, through the chair. As I said earlier, the community engagement plan is being developed. It will come to you for endorsement and adjustment as necessary. So we will identify the, the method and the extent of the consultation and you will endorse it before we commence it. So you are in total control of what we consult on, how we consult, for how long, who we consult with, all of those aspects are at your discretion. But, 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 but crucially, we won't be signing a deal until that consultation has run its course. That is absolutely correct. Right. Does that mean that Council we won't have detailed plans before we Councillor complete Councillor Martin. Now that's a question. Are you asking a question? I'm asking through a the question. chair. I'm asking through the chair. Right, thank you. Is the CEO giving us an assurance that that consultation plan will go out before the elected body receives either publicly or in confidence the plans for the Adelaide Crows for that site? No. That's not the. No, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Yeah. So we'll Councilor, formulate the consultation plan after we have the crow's plans. Is that correct, Councillor Martin? Well, that's exactly the point. No, so it's not a consultation. It's not, Councillor Canal. You have a question, or would you like to speak? Well, question first. Sure. Um, with uh, this needs analysis, uh, is that uh, would that not if when that needs to be completed first? So in that case one would assume that nothing's going to happen until that has come in and we get to, dis uh, we get to look and discuss it. In other words, is it not an effective, uh, you know, nothing will happen until that, uh, that is complete? Thanks, Tom. 
Great, presiding member, that's indeed correct. The, the needs analysis and the process that we're undertaking will inform the, uh, the plan that comes forward from the, the proponent. Uh, effectively, there's no plan unless it can actually talk to what our needs are in regards to the centre. So we'll actually support that. Um, so you're indeed correct. But that's in December. Councillor Moran. Oh, for God's sake. There's a process here. Councillor Canal still has the floor. Councillor Martin, you're noted for a question. Same with Councillor Martin. Yeah. Councillor Sims, I apologise. I suppose Councilor just Canal. following on from that, I mean, we've had so many words and, and so many quite harsh words about, you know, the process, et cetera, and you can take it any way you wish and any offence that you wish. But, uh, I mean, we do need to have something in place. I mean, there are a, a lots of, uh, uh, you know, uh, checks and balances along the way. And again, um, I, I, I see that we are working appropriately because, again, somebody has to come with some idea and they need to come to us and, and present something that we can actually uh, did, you know, argue about or, or discuss. And there, are, there is process as soon as we can offer something that somebody who is bringing us something that we have no idea about and at least only getting a few ideas as, as it's getting a little bit closer so that we can present and there's something to talk to. Because so far, we're, we're, this conversation is about uh, you know, things that aren't real. And I, I find that you know, it's difficult because in, in business, you can't afford to play with, with uh, you know, illusions. And I want to wait because of all the, the strong worded rhetoric that is just designed to get people in arms before we're actually able to come in and, and, and uh, uh, talk to them and with them uh, in a way that they can now comment and, and give us some direction as well. I mean, we're here for the for the public and also for the uh, for the good of uh, you know the whole corporation, so that we do deliver things that are you know needed, wanted, and also that are, you know, can fund and assist us to provide service. Thank you, Councillor Pennell. Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Sims. You've got a question, Councillor? Yes, I do. Thank I you. Do. It, it's further to the administration's comment. By way of background, last night we received a presentation from the Adelaide Crows here in this room about their intentions for that site. And they were going to continue. Yes, it was last night. Oh, sorry. To, yes. to continue to make plans to present to Council. Is it the case that the administration is saying that their plans will be informed by the needs analysis, which will not be available, we to know December. from the motion of council to December. So we're expecting the Crows to stop their planning process until they have the information available to them in December, or are we saying, go ahead and plan, and then you can have a look at the needs analysis in December and see what that might do to your plans? Through you, presiding member, without breaching confidentiality, uh, the the needs analysis is part of a process where we need to understand, uh, based on council's guiding principles, how a a new contemporary aquatic centre recreational facility would look. The the reality is, the proponent is working on a scheme. Part of that scheme is actually what a new recreational facility looks like. And without that information, it's very hard for them to finalise that in regards to However, they can work in parallel in regards to pieces of work that they can continue with, which they certainly know or can control or what they know that they wish to deliver. However, the recreational side is in our hands through our needs analysis to be able to inform the process. Once that's done, you will have a fully completed formatted plan that can be presented back to council for consideration. Thank you very much, Tom. Councillor Sims. I'm sorry to labour the point, Chair, but it is important to clarify because it's a it's a key issue. So just so that I'm very clear, it's not correct to say that the crows that this process is paused whilst council is doing the needs analysis because the crows will still be progressing other elements of the project, just not those that relate to the aquatic centre. Through you, presiding member, again noting confidentiality, what was presented last night effectively talks to in part of what they're thinking about to meet council's guiding principles. They have notionally talked about what they're trying to do in regards to community recreation, but again, that has not been finalised and it cannot be finalised until we actually undertake that needs analysis. And part of that is also to communicate and consult with our community. I'll talk to administration offline about the needs analysis and how we might finesse this so that it's clarified going into council. So I think I'll, I'll try to move the variation next week. Thank you, councillor. Councillors, would anyone else like to ask any questions or speak? Okay, be it that there's none. Before I hand over to councillor Hyde to sum up. Um, did you want to speak, Councillor? I apologise. I need to sum up. No, he, oh, he, 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 he. Sorry, I apologise for that. Look, I'll just briefly make a, uh, a couple of points. 
Um, just a bit of history for some of the elected members that have been here, although the Lord Mayor did point uh, about the Wingfield process. The reason also the unsolicited bid process was set up is to provide an opportunity for people in the community, businesses, community leaders to be able to engage with council through a process where they can feel that they are confident in being able to work with council and achieve outcomes for the community. There's never been a vehicle before for anyone to be able to do business with council whatsoever. And that's why the unsolicited bid process has come about. Um, in essence, if that bid process wasn't available, it would be quite an impossibility uh, for us to be able to engage with anyone with ideas out in the community. And it would be all up to the CEO to receive pretty much unsolicited bids that he would just whip up and put in a bin because we don't have a process in place. So first and foremost, that's why the unsolicited process occurred. Now, to the point and credit of councillor Martin Sims and Moran around the unsolicited bid process, if any councillor would have thought at the time that that would have meant parklands are involved, I think all of us probably would have turned around and said, look, maybe excluding the parklands, maybe let's leave the parklands aside, there's something we need to assess on merit, et cetera, et cetera. But it was brought in as a business vehicle for people to be able to involve themselves with business of council and put proposals to council. Now, what we have before us today, as I see it, is absolutely nothing. There has not been a formal process at which a submission that has been made formal to this council whatsoever, as far as I'm concerned. Because the unsolicited, unsolicited bid process talks about an idea. That idea was presented yesterday to council and it was presented to council in line with council's guiding principles. Now, if that idea doesn't meet council's guiding principles, then there's every opportunity for council to knock that idea out of the ballpark and say, we are not interested in doing business because the unsolicited bid process and also the guiding principles are not met as part of the design objectives and outcomes of that specific project. None of that has yet occurred. Council has not received yet a formal package with detailed design and detailed work answering at all to any of the guiding principles to council. I don't even know if they are met in detail. You can't even look at, at a, a presentation and go, yep, you've met every box. I don't feel that potentially, uh, I don't know that. So where the community involvement is really crucial, if we are going out right now to Councillor Sims Point and Councillor Martin, and we are consulting on the community with the community purely on one concept that says, would you like to see a structure, any structure on the parkland? If that is the consultation, not crows, not anything else, that might be a valid point to discuss as part of that process. However, as part of an unsolicited bid process, it would be remarkable to go out to the community with a detailed package and a detailed formal submission that has landed on council's table where we can go out and engage properly with the community and receive the consultation it deserves. I think there, are, there is a mix up there. And I think to your point, it's very valid. Do we want to see something on the parkland? That is a consultation on its own. And potentially there is a consultation on if it's the crows and there are guiding principles, what does that look like? Unfortunately to some council members, there is still a council decision which talks to a unsolicited bid process. And as long as the proponent is conforming with the unsolicited bid process and going through the steps, then they're not violating anything unless a councillor decides to move in the chamber to rescind a previous decision motion and stop this. That's a separate decision and that's a matter for council. But if that council was to support that decision, that stops in the tracks. If that council doesn't support that decision, then I'm hopeful council members can respect the process of council and stick to this process and hopefully see an outcome. And I know we've all spoken tonight and we've spoken outside the recommendation currently because the recommendation talks about noting and noting. It's quite simple. I did allow that debate to happen because I think it's important for elected members to voice their concerns and opinion, being that this has been the first opportunity ever for us to chat about this in public. With that in mind, uh, I'd ask uh, Councillor Ibrahim Zeta to sum up with regards to this motion and look forward to debating this further in formalising that recommendation at Council next week. Thank you, Chair. Um, am I able to ask a question before I sum up? I prefer that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a very quick question. Um, uh, just, just to confirm, um, legally, can we consult right now? Yes. yes. Legally. 
through the chair, council consult at any time on anything, uh, but at the moment we have nothing to consult. So there's nothing to, to consult on at the moment. Consult the concept. We can consult the consult um, uh, chair, um, I know that every single one of us here tonight is in a difficult position, and um, uh, we do have some uh, difficult decisions to, to make. And I think that's what leadership is about. I know that each and every one of us are held to account by our ratepayers. We're here to look after our ratepayers. We're here to uh, to make sure whatever we do here in the city of Adelaide benefits them. Uh, I personally am looking forward to uh, some of this community consultation. And as a member of the public, if everything goes through with this proposal, and if it is something that council decides to, to go ahead with, and if we do get a, uh, a new facility there, uh, I'll be looking forward to using that facility as a member of public. Well, hang on. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor. With that, I put the motion to you. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll move on to the next item, item 5.2, minor amendments to the development plan amendment, and um, that's item 5.2. Members, can I seek a mover, please, for that motion? Councillor Moran, you're pretty quick, usually. I'm on strike. You're on strike? <laughs> as long as you don't starve yourself. Uh, moved by Councillor Canal. Can I have a second, please? Second by Councillor Renzo. <laughs> Any discussion on that motion? Any questions from elected members? Thank you, Sorry, Sorry. keep using your mind. Councillor, uh, Councillor, I can all sum up. No. Summed up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Members, we move on to item 5.3. The review of event noise mitigation standard operating procedures. That's again been an item that's come to Council before. And I'd ask members again, um, I'd ask for a mover of that motion. Moved by Councillor Hyde. Seconded by, by the uh, Lord Mayor. Councillor uh, Hyde would like to speak. Um, yes, I'd just like to thank administration um, uh, for revising uh, based on the feedback that was brought, uh, well, that we that we gave from uh, on the presentation uh, in July. So I think uh, I think this um, is, a, is a very good outcome. Um, uh, I think it'll be better for the residents in North Adelaide, um, of course, where we're dropping the decibelage. Um, uh, I think that will make a, a very big impact um, on their on their quality of life because it's those extra decibels, those extra five ten decibels, particularly that C weighting, as the report says, the base um, uh, that uh, that causes a lot of the issues. So um, uh, the focus is is on that, and of course not on curtailing um, events um, in the city. So uh, I think this is a good body of work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Lord Mayor, would you like to speak as a seconder? Um, thank you, uh, Chair. I, I, again, I'd uh, like to add my thanks to Councillor Hines and uh, for the work that's been done. Uh, it's a great piece of work. And uh, I also support the fact that uh, we will continue to enjoy a vibrant and culturally enriching, enriching Adelaide experience. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a good piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Sims. Uh, a question first to the administration. In the original proposal, the administration recommended that there should be a cessation of amplified music. Um, what were the hours uh, that were recommended in respect to Pinky Flat and Pennington Gardens? Uh, through the chair, um, the hours that we originally were proposing were to reduce Pinky Flat from 3 a.m. finishing time till midnight. And Pennington Gardens um, down to midnight also. From 3 a.m.? Uh, from memory, yes. And that was the report of July 23rd? The workshop, yes, correct. Yeah. Um, look, Chair, I'd like to propose an amendment to this. Sure. And it is uh, that the committee recommends to the Council that the recommendations of the administration to Council on July 23rd in respect of noise mitigation. So sorry, Councillor, just give me a second. So are you um, amending uh, those one, two, and three? Correct. You are all of them? So you want to delete it? Yep. So delete one, two, and three? Yep. And you have a new recommendation? Uh, yeah. Oh, just hang on a sec. The council of members will we'll be considered as part of the final recommendation. Um, um, so so one, is, one is out.
Lord Mayor, just one second, please, I can get clarity. One is our recommendation to the committee on July 23rd. So this is one is replaced with this, the words that I'm giving you now. Yep. Uh, recommendations to, to the committee on July 23rd. And then. Um, okay, committee workshop on July 23rd, if that's um, appropriate. Um, it was the administration report to which I referred. Councillor Martin, if you can finish your recommendation. Yep. No interruptions, please, until Councillor Martin puts his recommendation on the screen. Yep, I'm happy with two. So I don't and understand the first part, Councillor. So that council that the recommendation. Oh, I'm sorry, that was finished. Yeah, yeah. That the recommendations to the committee workshop on uh, the, the administration's recommendations. So Councillor, we've got we start with that council and then what's the word that you want to use there? Oh okay. Uh, adopts, adopts. Yep, adopts the recommendations. The administrations. Yep. Recommendations to the committee workshop. Yep. On July 23rd, 2019, full stop will do. Thank you. I'm happy with two, happy sure. with three, unless the administration advises me that they're in conflict with one. Sure. So let's just see, let's see if you've got a, a mover there. So you've basically, just for the clarity of everyone in the room, so we've got a second of Councillor Land, but just so everyone's clear on what has been proposed by Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin has <coughs> proposed instead of noting the recommendations of the review of council event policy is requested that be deleted and that the new in red adopts the administration's recommendation to the committee workshop on 23rd of July 2019. Before I get Councillor Martin to speak, um, does the administration have any remarks? Uh, thank you, Chair. The challenges that we presented about in the detail pack about 40 to 50 slides, this one, Councillor, um, and we were asking at that workshop for feedback, which we have now incorporated into this paper as a recommendation for you to consider. So I'm keen to understand um, which elements of the 40 odd slides you, you want to see incorporated, well, just absolutely everything. All, all, all of those, all of those recommendations are addressed in the subsequent report, which is there tonight related to operating hours, relating to decibel levels, um, mm -hmm. and yes, they're in there. Um, but I'm so happy to take advice. Councillor, yeah, thank you. So just to complete your advice there, Claire. My advice would be to shape a recommendation tonight which captures the concerns that you want to see back in the um, guidelines to go out to consultation. So if it's in relation to the operating hours of Pinky Flat, yep. if it's in relation to the operating hours of Pennington, Pennington and if it's just those two things like square levers is, I'm not sure which elements. Yes, no, they're the only two I'm um, concerned so, about. Okay, so. And you'll perhaps, replicate then the decibel levels as well? What I'm asking from you, please, councillor, is to give me a recommendation tonight that I can work with administratively. All right. So, councillor, just to assist you, being yep. that this is on the fly at quarter to nine, this is, yes, coming, to this is coming to council next week. Mm -hmm. Would you like the opportunity to discuss this with administration in more detail and form a position? No, I'm, ha I'm happy, happy to raise it now. Do you want to debate it today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it is the administration's request that it makes more sense to leave it as it is mm -hmm. and simply say at the end of one, um, procedures comma with the exception of the proposed hours uh, for uh, Pinky Flat and Pennington Gardens which will uh, remain as per the recommendation uh, at the workshop on July 23rd at midnight. Would that be satisfactory? Can I get some clear answer on that? Can I have a, I need some clear answer if that's okay. Councillor Martin asked a question. Um, through the chair, I think, and I think Claire um, tried to um, well, answer this previously, but at the workshop we were putting to forward some proposals around times. It wasn't actually a formal recommendation. Um, so Councillor I think Kuros. that if you were seeking to 
found the support or for us to re revisit the hours for Pinky Flat and Paddington Gardens, then may, I would probably do that as a separate. Okay, look, I'm sensing the sensitivity around this. So if, if I took out the word recommendation and just said, which remain uh, at midnight, that would, that would be satisfactory to you? There's no inference of administration recommendation there. Okay, well, that's, that's yeah, I think that helps. Thank so, um, thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Moran, are you happy with that change because you seconded the original motion? Yes, as long as it brings the hours of those two places back to 12, I'm happy. So, Councillor, can I get a lead from the Chamber just to um, see if we accept those changes? Thank you. Can I get a show of hands? Can I get no, a show no, of hands? Hang, hang on. Chair, that motion hadn't been formed. I have had that motion formed and seconded by Councillor Moran. That's what happened, and then you've changed it, so it's been varied. Well, if that's the case, I'll revert back to the original. No, no, so, we all, they, they got a majority change. You've got it. Yeah. Councillor, it is my advice that you meet with the administration between now and Council, and that Council adopts the original for now, and it will give you the opportunity to form the motion the way you want. Um, this has been varied now on the fly twice. Uh, yes, and I know, <laughs> Deputy uh, Lord Mayor, doing things on the fly. Now. Works out. Um, okay, look, I'll I'll take your advice. Only for you, Councillor. No, and look, I do the same for you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, uh, all right, look, I'll sus suspend what I'm proposing. I will bring that back to the council meeting unless I hear otherwise from the administration between now and next Tuesday. But that is the confirmed Thank event. Thank you, Councillor. So, I can I have a mover of the original motion, please. Councillors, I know it's getting late, but I need people to respond on our call for a mover and a second. Okay, so we have Hyde and the Lord Mayor for the original. Okay, any further remarks? Can I have Councillor Hyde sum up? Summed up. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Really? All those against? That is carried. Really? No, we move to um, <laughs> item 5.4, the review of Adelaide Parklands Events Management Plan 2016-2020. And if I can have a council member uh, please move um, the recommendation. Thank you, moved by the Lord Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Abraham Zeta. Uh, Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak? I'll reserve my right. Councillor Brent, is that my right, yeah. Councillor um, I would... Uh, Can you use your mic, please? So we don't get into um, the same same suit that we just did in the previous motion. I would like to flag that I'm not... I'm going to change the um, uh, the plans for Creswell Gardens um, at Council, and I will um, discuss that. I won't throw it to this while that changes sure. in there, and I'll discuss it with the staff. Thank you, Councillor Mary, for letting us know. Um, any other remarks or debate from councillors? Yeah. I agree with councillor. Thank you, councillors. Uh, back to the Lord Mayor. Summer. Summer. Okay, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. We'll move on to um, item um, six, council member discussion forum items. Is there any items that council members would wish to discuss? If not, I'm going to hand over to the CEO for a quick minute. Yes. Uh, no, just quickly, please. Thank you. Just one second. Um, thank you. Sorry, um, just one second, please. Thank you. Would any council member like to report anything as part of the members forum? Oh, it's been long, really. Yep, okay. Be it that there's uh, none. I did raise a question before with the administration with regards to parking controls uh, with schools, um, and I think we've got a response. Um, thank you. So a couple of council members did get in touch with us following um, an editorial um, commentary uh, in the advertiser recently in relation to um, keeping children safe around school zones in the city. Um, we've been doing some work in various um, city schools since April. I've asked Vanessa to come tonight just to give you two minutes on what the um, program has been um, and uh, what their likely time frames are in our next steps. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thanks, Claire and the Chair. I will only take a couple of minutes. Um, 
So in an effort to improve children's safety around schools, our parking and information officers visited every school in April, sharing the flyer that's um, up on the screen and asking for their help with educating parents and those transporting children about the risks of illegal parking around schools. We appeal to parents to be mindful of their behaviour around schools to ensure pedestrian safety as they're their, great, their children's greatest role model. Um, each school was asked to include information in their regular newsletter and they were provided with as many flyers as they needed. And this initiative re received positive feedback from most schools who were keen to assist with reducing the risks to children's safety. Between May and the first week of term three, our parking and information officers handed out flyers and issued warnings to drivers who were illegally parked around the schools. Many drivers reacted positively to the information. However, there remained drivers ignoring the messaging and the warnings. We tried to alleviate the dangerous parking as much as possible prior to issuing any expiations. However, requests from the public to police these areas, as well as reports of cyclists being knocked off their bikes due to bike lanes being blocked, and our officers themselves witnessing some near misses with children running in front of other vehicles to jump in their parents' car continued. Previously, we've requested the assistance of SAPOL when illegal parking has created significant congestion to the traffic flow. However, we wanted to try a more proactive approach to avoid similar situations. Um, the, the article in the advertiser last week also suggested that our parking and information officers were being sneaky and unfair. And, and I think this may have been um, in reference to the fact that they were taking photographs of the vehicles and posting the expiations in the mail rather than issuing them on the vehicles. And there's two reasons that our parking and information officers do that. Um, one is for, uh, well, they're both related to safety. So the first reason is many of the illegally parked vehicles were double parked in the road. And so for our officers to issue an expiation um, to those cars directly, it's actually unsafe. So we, we don't allow our officers to walk onto the road to issue an expiation. The other reason they do that is often they are subject to some very um, unpleasant abuse from members of the public. And so we advise our officers not to put themselves in those situations. And that's another reason why they take photographs rather than issue the expiations on the vehicle. And, and I, I guess it's just worth reminding everyone that unless there's some sort of bizarre mistake, our officers only expiate illegally parked vehicles, not legally parked vehicles. And, and in and around schools, the, their responsibility is about monitoring the safety of, of the public and we take that role really seriously. And I just wanted to, and the fact that we were educating drivers for sort of months before we started issuing um, expiations, I, you know, I think people had plenty of warning. I, I, I don't believe that our officers were being sneaky um, and they were actually quite visible. Um, that's the photograph in the, in the newspaper. So I just wanted to assure members that we're, you know, we're taking an educative approach where we can, but sometimes we do have to issue expiations to, to change people's behaviour. Thank you very much for that. Vanessa, there's no questions in this forum. So, um, simply to noting, would you like to add a new comment, Councillor? Yeah, uh, simply that. Uh, coincidentally, I have had a communication from a ratepayer today who uh, claims he was photographed, in fact, clearly he is photographed sitting in his vehicle. Um, uh, uh, he arrived there 30 seconds earlier. He says a parking inspector did not approach me or make any signal to move on. He just stood in front of the vehicle and took a photo without any engagement or warning. He could clearly see me. I moved immediately. No ticket was written or placed on my vehicle. Now, um, I just raise my concern that I think there is a necessity for a level of engagement. If someone who's committed an expiatable um, uh, offence is standing or sitting right near the individual and there has been no engagement, there is no such behaviour in any other agency that I know of. It is not reasonable to take a photograph of someone without attempting, if this case is correct, to engage in any way at all with an individual. Thank you, Councillor. I'll have to leave it here. Um, Councillors, uh, thank you very much. With that, I 
declare the meeting officially closed at uh, 8.56 p.m. And I'll thank you all very much.